Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. I'm really excited to speak with Shamir Karkal, who is the co-founder and CEO at Scylla. Scylla is a fantastic embedded finance company that has a number of really interesting features from ACH APIs to digital wallets to all sorts of things that we're going to open up and talk about. But he also has a deep background in both traditional banking as well as in neobanking, digital lending, being a co-founder of Simple. So with that, let me welcome Shamir to the conversation. Thank you, Lex. I'm glad to be here. So here's the, either it's a softball or it's a hardball, depending on the person. But tell us what got you interested in finance. Like, what were some of your earlier experiences in the industry and why did you start caring for it? Well, so in some ways, I was born into the industry. My mom and dad were both bankers. They worked at, at retail banks in India back in the 70s and 80s. So I, I, I still remember in like, you know, in the 80s in Bangalore and in the 90s as well, like driving with my dad to pick up my mom and, and she would be at the central currency chest because this was all a cash economy back then, right? And so, and, and you know, sometimes she'd be working late and I'd sit around and then she'd be counting stacks of cash before putting them in the vault and then she'd hand me a stack of cash to account for me, right? So the it's interesting because it's around that same time in 1989 that I learned to program. And so my, my life has kind of been defined by those two things, right? Programming and, and, and banking. And I actually tried to get away from banking. <laughs> I was very interested in physics as a, as a kid and, and wanted to go study physics. And so I ended up doing an undergraduate in computer science and, and physics, and then went off to be a software engineer, and then kind of stumbled back into the world of finance after going to business school. It's inescapable, the black hole of finance and money, isn't it? It is. I mean, it uh, drives our lives so much. Every year, if you look at the top New Year's resolutions that people make, they're all about getting healthier or getting financially healthier, <laughs> right? And so it depends on where the economy is. If the economy is booming, then everybody is focused on like getting physically healthy. But if the economy is, is sinking, then all the resolutions are about getting financially healthy, like, you know, and, and, the, and the prescriptions are kind of the same, right? If you want to get healthier, probably eat less and work out more is, 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 a, is a pretty basic idea that works for most people. And if you want to get financially healthier, like earn more and spend less. But in practice, it is very, very hard to do. In terms of your early career, I want to ask this in sort of a silly way. You were working kind of on the technology side, engineering and technology side, and you said that you started programming early on. How do you think about what you were doing as programming versus what today people do as developers? You know, like I'm kind of stuck on this idea of like the core developers of a blockchain protocol versus the programmers in the IT department of a bank. You know, how do you think about that? Yeah, so the, I use the word programming because that's what everybody used back in the 80s and 90s. Right? So that's how I thought about it then when I was like a you know 10-year-old kid learning to write my first few lines of code. And I would say that like if, if I had to draw a distinction between like programming versus development, it's about everything else that goes into not just writing the code, right? Like if you're... When, when I was in in school or or you know or even in college, right? Like you, your goal was to write a program that solved a specific problem because that was the problem that the teacher had set out to you, right? Like, and it got more and more complex, but it was always like you build this. If it compiles and runs and it does A B C D E F, you're good, and you're you know you got a high score, you passed your exam, whatever. And that to me is is kind of programming at its core. Development is a lot more complex because it's in the real world, there aren't any like tests, right? Like every day is a test <laughs> and you have users and users are complex and they'll tell you they want ABC when they really want 
CDEF, right? And so much of systems development is about understanding what users need and delivering that to them and then collecting the feedback from them and, and constantly iterating and, and re-engineering, right? So that's I, I, if I had to define programming versus development, that's how I would do it. But there's also an interesting nuance that you picked up on there, which is that programming is frequently used almost as a, I wouldn't say a derogatory term, but almost as a minimizing term, you know, to, to sort of say, hey, you know, that just like we have operations people back there fixing whatever broken ACH problems. We also have programmers somewhere deep in the walls, you know, fixing our computers. But in reality, the, the, you know, the heroes of the story are the bankers or whomever else, right? And, and so you, you typically don't see the word programming used in the tech industry or a programmer as a job, a job description. You use, you see engineer or developer. Yeah, it's a very interesting cultural transformation. And I'd love to learn how you went from like solving the specific problem to the more strategic work that you started doing at McKinsey and your experience there. Because that is also quite a jump, right? Getting out of, we're going to figure out somebody else has done the business analysis and I'm designing some particular feature to really thinking about strategy and thinking about a business. Tell us how that happened. Yeah. So for me, that was just going to business school, right? Like when I went to business school, I had a very clear plan of what I wanted to do because I was a software engineer and I wanted to go from being a software engineer to being a software manager. And and, and I was like, well, where, how do I learn about management? Well, I guess there's these schools where they teach you management. So let's go to one of them, right? And ended up going to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And, and this was right after I came to the US. And that's what, what, by the time I got out of business school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with life. <laughs> right? For me, that was an, it was an eye-opening experience. I really didn't know anything about like, you know, the worlds of investment banking, consulting, how, how business really fundamentally worked in the US and in most parts of the world. And so the I spent a summer at an investment bank, actually in Japan as an intern between, you know, my first and second year of business school and decided that investment banking really wasn't for me. And so that was kind of like, well, what do I go do now? And I'm like, well, let's see, let's, let's try consulting. And so that's how I ended up at McKinsey. The way my wife described it, and I think it's, it's very accurate, is that any of the big consulting firms, it's almost like getting a third or fourth year of business school, right? Except that a lot of the kind of what you studied as case studies in business school, now it's a lot, it's, it's, it's real, right? Like you have real clients, real problems. There isn't a, a professor who's going to solve these for you at the end of a class. You have to figure stuff out yourself. And it just so happened that my first study or project at McKinsey was working for a large processor, you know, an old school bank core processor. And that's where I learned so much about like how the kind of the banking industry in the US actually works, which is, is still true now, whatever, 15 years later, right? And so they just kind of fell into that and then just did, you know, three and a half years at McKinsey doing everything from like cross-sell for retail banks in the US to country bailouts to large bank turnarounds in Europe and and then just, just got this like super broad understanding of the global financial ecosystem, which has really been helpful over the last 10, 12 years as you know, built first simple and now Scylla. That education is priceless and I had a kind of a similar upbringing in strategy for the investment management business and taking like a broad industry approach and actually trying to troubleshoot things from, from a consulting type hat is really, really useful and a fantastic skill set. And especially in FIG, in, in financial services where you have such specialized business models, I think the comment around you know, learning core banking five years ago, 10 years ago, 25 years ago, you're probably going to understand what the foundation is for that industry. And you have to understand the foundation in order to try and actually change it. It's not pleasant to learn it, but once you know it, you have a really important advantage over people who operate at the level of words, but not at the level of taking apart the machinery. Completely, man. I mean, so much time I spent in like, you know, bank branches in the Midwest or, or in the Middle East, for that matter, just like trying to understand how they actually function <laughs> and what did people walk in and, and try and do and, and how the business model of the bank itself worked. And even now, some of the insights are kind of like super surprising. I remember there was this one bank we were 
working with in 2008. And this was just as the, you know, the great financial crisis was taking off. I was a mid-sized bank in the Midwest of the US and they suddenly had a lot of customers asking about FDIC insurance because <laughs> that, that became a, a hot button topic in the summer of 08. And they, you know, this was like, F, the, the last bank run in the U.S. was like 80 years before that, right, in the 30s. So it wasn't a, a question which they, they'd ever spent analyzing or understanding. The question that was asked was like, okay, how many customers are actually holding deposits above the FDIC insured limit, right? And we looked at that and we were like, well, it's actually a very small number of customers. It was like, like way less than 1% of customers, right? So in that way, it's it's not a big concern, right? But if you look at the number of total deposits that this small percentage of customers is holding, it's actually huge. It's like 20% of your deposit base <laughs> comes from this tiny fraction that's holding money above the FDIC insured limit. And in fact, there was one customer who was holding $16 million in his or her retail bank account. And it's like, what? <laughs> and and so that was that was a surprising insight for me, which I think people still don't realize is that in many cases in banking, whether it's in lending or whether it's in the deposit business, the long tails actually drive a lot of the business. That's so bizarre. Were you looking at auction rate securities at that time at all? I never did any work with them kind of directly, but I remember <laughs> as one bank in, in Europe that I was working with, which had quite a bit of trouble with them in late 08 and then all through 09. It was the same experience that you described that I remember where auction rate securities are these kind of money market fund type things that get their interest rate from an auction and the auctions never fail ever. So of course you would classify it as a cash equivalent on your asset allocation, except the one time that they failed during the financial crisis and everybody sues you because now they can't pull out their cash because it's actually a fixed income derivative, not a cash equivalent. It's exactly this kind of ugly plumbing, I think, that some of my favorite stuff of the industry. Oh, totally. I remember this one congressional hearing which Ben Bernanke went to. And I think this was November of 08. It, it was definitely you know Q4 of 08. And he was having it was all about the crisis and what the Fed was doing. And then one congressman asked him the a question, which was basically like, hey, so I'm hearing from my constituents that the, the big problem they're facing is, is warehouse lending. So what is the Fed doing to like get warehouse lending going again, right? And, and I was like, oh, that's a great question. I do wonder what the Fed is doing. And then, but Banky started asking. And so I started answering the question. And I realized he had no idea what warehouse lending was. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, he, he gave this like generic answer of like, you know, just basically like brushed aside the question. But just the look on his face, I'm like, oh man, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, he he's an economist. And then kind of, you know, spent a large part of his career in academia and then and in the Fed, of course. But, and it's like, he works with like financial models of the whole economy. Exactly how a mortgage loan goes from origination to ending up in a, in in some mortgage backed security and and the the steps, the operational steps of that process, he has no clue about, right? And the same thing with like money market securities, auction rate securities. Heck, the Fed funds rate. I still remember this in October of '09. The Fed decided to start, oh, eight, actually, they decided to start dropping the Fed funds rate. And they couldn't, couldn't get it to go down. And there was the Fed funds target and the actual Fed funds rate. And that was like 2 3% between them. And it was just, you know, it was, it was unimaginable. This had never happened in, the, in history before, right? It's like, wait, what is the problem here? Why can't the Fed control the interest rate? And the thing is, the Fed controls the overnight interest rate by printing money and buying bonds. Well, they shifted to buying bonds on the on the repo, mainly because of this, actually. But what they realized was that the banks weren't lending to each other. <laughs> and if the banks are not lending to each other, the Fed can try and print as much money as it wants. But you know the rates are going to stay elevated. And the Fed had to go out and, and sort of do TARP. And, and that's when things started getting back in line. But it was the most insane thing to see, to realize that even the Fed that can print money can't control the overnight interest rate at times of crisis. 
you look at an economic textbook and this is sort of the yada, yada, yada between, you know, the expand and contract money supply. It's also the difference between the map and the reality. The map, as you see, it's a mental model that you have of the world and then the actual reality, which is most likely you're uploading some sort of CSV into a system run by um, a Cobalt Foundation. And so with that as our background, tell us how you moved on to Simple and what was Simple in the early days and how did that founding happen and and what is it that excited you about it? As most things, I kind of fell into it, right? So I had this good friend of mine called Josh Reich, whom I'd met at business school. He was Australian, but he had come to the US to, to go to business school, just like I'd come from India. He was actually a, an internet entrepreneur. He'd already you know, been CTO of a startup in Australia, had a small exit. And then came to came to the U.S. So he actually specifically wanted to get into finance because he had an undergrad in math, and his thesis was that his startup had all been about like marketing ad tech technology. And he was like, nobody in advertising really respects math and data, but in financial services they do. So I, I need to sw- switch uh, from marketing to financial services. He after business school he went off to work at an early stage startup in in New York and he and I stayed in touch and chatted about you know all the stuff that we are chatting about the craziness of the world the financial world from 07 to 09 and then in summer of 09 he sent me an email saying let's start a retail bank and his thesis was you know I've I've blogged about that email multiple times so if you search me online you can find the original email and see what he sent me his thesis was that banking is just you know, very, very simple at its core, right? It's like you take money from people, you hold on to it, you lend it out for a, you pay them an interest rate, you get an interest rate on the loans and, you know, the try to make some money and in in between. And then you try to help people manage their money and, and achieve financial wellness as, as best as you can. Really, when you do that well, banking should be, you know, it, it, it should be like turning on a tap, right? Like you don't understand how the water gets into the tap and you don't care. (laughs) When you need it, you turn it on, it's there and you turn it off. But in reality, banking is so massively complicated because banks go to great lengths to to try and make more money out of you. And the typical way they do it is through, you know, what other people have called like gotcha banking, right? They create all these super complex products. And if you make a mistake in using those products, then they make money and you and you don't, right? So banks, especially in the US, have set themselves up with this business model, which is almost antagonistic with customers, when in reality, banking should be very, very simple. And he was like, can we change that? Can we start a bank that actually wants to help customers achieve their financial goals and live a better life and, and you know, keep it very, very simple? <laughs> and that's where the idea for Simple came along. I mean, it was a, it was a very compelling vision then. I think it's still a very compelling vision now. <laughs> what I didn't realize when I read that email was that the, the, it was like three or four paragraphs long. And I think the entire industry has gotten maybe maybe through paragraph one at this point of, of the ideas in that email. <laughs> at Simple, we barely managed to get like two lines deep because the, the vision was humongous and the ability to execute was highly limited, right? But it got me very excited. I was based in Brussels at the time, but I flew into New York, uh, hung out with Josh. Uh, He lived in New York, chatted with him about it. We went and we spoke to some investors who were also very interested in the idea. And, you know, we said, okay, screw it. We're going to give it a shot. So end of 09, I moved to New York and started working on uh, Simple in Josh's basement. And here we are, right? Like, 12, almost 13 years later. Yeah, it's a great story. And, you know, for those of that don't know, Simple was probably the first neobank or API driven bank or digital bank that kind of plugged into this vector that has been very mainstream now. But, you know, I think to that moment, and it was probably after Mint.com had their exit and you started to see robo advisors like Betterment, Wealthfront and others turning on. And then on the banking side, there wasn't very much. I think it was it was you guys, it was maybe Move-In that was trying to do something in the space, although quite different. And a bunch of maybe like retail brokerage, social following type apps. How did you think about others at the time? Were there companies that you liked or admired? like, Or was it all internally motivated when you were building the company? Oh, we looked at everybody that we could find, right? And I have to say that, you know, like Mint, I think, got acquired in late 09 or early 10. This is when we were still pretty early at Simple. And that was that was exciting 
for us to see because it was it was great to see that you know a fintech startup could be founded in the consumer space grow rapidly and then get acquired by intuit i think for what was a large sum of money i think it was somewhere like 150 200 million dollars or something and so it, it, it in a in a way it validated the entire consumer financial services space. I think the thing that Mint always struggled with was they didn't really have a business model. But we did, me and Josh definitely use the Mint product. We were like, oh, so you can get consumer banking data through services like Yodli back then. And and it is an interesting kind of experience. It, it validated this core idea that customers were looking for financial wellness. And financial wellness could be improved by using technology like smartphones and apps. Remember, this was an era when most banks didn't have any mobile app at all, right? So online banking existed, but mobile banking barely existed at all. We looked at folks like ING. ING had its product, ING Direct, which was around for the checking account on ING Direct got launched just pre-crisis. So it had been around for like three, four years by 2010. And they never really marketed it as a core banking replacement for regular people, but was still heavily focused on the like savings account idea. But it was interesting to see how they went about it, right? The product features they built in. The other inspirations we took, there was a company called Perk Street, which got launched, I think again, in 2010, maybe. And it was like, if you had to pick which was the first neobank anywhere in the planet, I think you'd have to choose between Perk Street and Simple. Perk Street was launched earlier than Simple. You could argue whether it was truly a neobank or not. The kind of the structure of modern neobanking that everybody from, as far as I know, from like Chime to Current operate on now, that was really created by Simple, right? But we got, we borrowed a lot of ideas from Perk Street as well. And, and one of the great things about Perk Street was like, we were like, so who, how did these guys do it, right? They actually have like a banking product, but they're not a bank. Whom are they working with? Because you need a bank to get access to, you know, the payment systems and, and to hold deposit. And we discovered Bancor Bank that way. And we were like, okay, what is this Bancor Bank and where is it? And how do we get in touch with them, right? So that's where discussion with Bancor Bank started in like, I think, March or April of 2010. And they eventually ended up being a launch partner, although it took a long time, right, from First email from Josh to actually launching Simple took three years. Mm. I mean, there were some real differences in market perception too at that time, which is like banking and investing and lending, they almost were different industries. If you're doing an investing app, you would never think to attach a retail bank to it. And vice versa, if you were doing a banking or budgeting play, you wouldn't, it took a long time to get to the place where we are now, which is basically everything's in APIs and you can plug it into any B2C retail footprint and you can grow that footprint to millions of people. So let's transition to that story and kind of come to to the moment when BBVA is looking at, at buying Simple. And can you tell us a little bit about sort of the state of APIs, the strategy that BBVA had in looking at the acquisition, and then you know some of the reasons that it made sense to plug into a large traditional bank rather than be independent? Yeah, so this all really got going in 2013 and 2012, right? So I think BBVA first learned of Simple through Dave McClure at 500 Startups, right? So 500 Startups was a small investor in in Simple, but BBVA was an LP in their fund. And so they reached out to me and uh, December of 2012, I think, just after we had, six months after we had launched, I went and met the executive team at BBVA in Dave's offices in Palo Alto, right? And it was actually everybody. It was like the chairman and CEO the and kind of his three or four top lieutenants. The meeting, basically, I did what I did to every VC, right? Like I pitched the simple vision, the story. We had launched and we had I don't know, 15, 20,000 customers at that point. So I gave them a demo of the product and they asked a couple of questions. It was all civil and friendly and everything else. And then at the end of it, Jay Reinemann, actually, who was the one of the part of the VC team of BBVA, which was still very early at that point, but he was in the room as well. And he asked me a question. He was like, Shamir, why are you telling us all of this? Right? Like, 
he didn't use those words, but he was basically like, you're completely open kimono and everything in your product and your company. Aren't you worried that we'll steal your ideas or, or the, uh, we, we compete with you? At, because, you know, maybe VA had a bank in the US, which they had acquired in 2009. And so they were one of the top 30 banks in the US at that point. So not huge, but not small either, right? I just looked at Jay and I was like, Jay, if I gave you my entire code base, you couldn't compete with me. <laughs> because, you <don't, laughs> like, you know, you, you, there's no way that, even if you manage to figure out how to run this app and launch it and get it going, the, the simple isn't the app or kind of the, the, the specific features it has today. It's the, the people and the way that we are constantly building and evolving it, by the, basically, by the time you copy my ideas, I'll be so far ahead. I don't even view you guys as competitors, right? Like, and, and that wasn't that wasn't me posturing. That was that was the honest truth. I was like, no large bank in the U.S. at that point had any chance at all of competing with with Simple on a product basis, right? They could compete on rates. They could compete on like, you know, whatever, cashback rewards. They could throw money at, <laughs> at customer acquisition, but they couldn't ship a better product. They, they, no way at all. And I think that, that's that actually, that has been validated. Even today, if you open up Vero or Chime or One or Current or any of the top neobanks, and then you go open up like, I don't know, Chase, Bofa, Wells, any of the large banks, you can still see a pretty significant gap in the quality of their mobile apps. All the large banks have mobile apps now. They have tried to copy a lot of the features of you know, you know the neo banks. Much of it was innovated by Simple a decade ago. But even now, a decade later, the the neo banks on kind of a core product capability perspective are still quite a bit ahead of all the large banks. And that's despite, you know, however many billions of dollars have been thrown into it over the years, right? But back in 2012, that was like you know, the banks weren't even in the game. Most of them still had no mobile apps. I don't think even BBVA had a mobile app at that point. So that got the <laughs> the BBVA team, especially the chairman, going. And and he was like, "I get what you're saying. And yes, the you know banking in the in the US kind of sucks, <laughs> but but we are different, and we we see and we understand the future. And that and you know, he basically was like, "We are different from your average US bank, and 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 we could be more competitive with you." And I kind of backtracked and said, "Yes, no, actually." If you look at banking globally, Spanish banks had some of the best technology, the best mobile experiences, and, and sort of the stuff they were doing back in the 06 to 09 era was actually far ahead of what the U.S. banks were doing. Still is, I think. <laughs> One of the banks that we do inspiration from was uh, La Caixa in Spain. And, and I used to read and write case studies on them when I was at McKinsey, right? So so I, I kind of was like, no, 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 but the Spanish banks, I get it. You guys are, are actually pretty savvy on technology and, and kind of better than the U.S. banks. But, you know, your U.S. bank is still a U.S. bank, right? <laughs> and we are not in Spain. So that kind of, like, that's where we left it. But then nine, 12 months later, they they jumped into the process. We were actually close to being acquired by somebody else, but then they got into it at the last minute. And they were very aggressive in, in wanting to acquire Simple. And the the thesis for them was basically that neobanking would be a huge part of the future of banking in the US for sure, but actually globally. And they wanted to, A, build their online banking presence in the U.S. massively. And at the same time, they also wanted to take a lot of the learnings from Simple and spread it across all their units. I think at that time, BBVA was had like decent sized banks in 10 or 11 countries across the globe and presence in like 30 in total, right? So they, 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 they wanted to kind of take that and spread it across the world as well. Really fascinating stuff. Thank you for opening that up. I'd love to get your thoughts on sort of the wave of interest in open banking infrastructure that we've seen over the last maybe five years or so. And people call it embedded finance. There were financial MPIs. It was called open banking. And there's all sorts of ways to talk about it. And you know, the way that I see it is you leave the traditional architecture alone, but you wire things on top in such a way that it is modern and usable. I'd love to get your sense on how you saw that evolving. And, you know, as BBVA was shifting the the simple 
sort of business towards providing that open architecture in particular, at least it seemed to me that was their priority and their vision. How was that experience? What did you learn while that was going on? And I'm sure that led to your next entrepreneurial experience, but I want to get a little bit of the flavor and the fabric of what that was like. Yeah, so BBV acquired Simple in early 2014. It was March, I think, when the deal closed. And then we, it was in the summer, I think, of 14 that I was in Madrid. That's right. I was in Madrid and I went to meet the, the BBVA team. I was actually there on vacation. <laughs> so not not there for like a work, but I was like, hey, I'll come by. I'll meet everybody. I'll have a chat with them. And I did. And then one of them was like, hey, we have this idea of building APIs. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. And he was like, oh, it's just an idea. You should go talk to Carlos Torres, the guy who was, I think he was the, I don't know, I remember his exact title back then, but he became the CEO and now he's the chairman, right? So I went and met with Carlos and asked him about what's this all about, this whole idea about API banking, or what do you guys plan to do in the, with APIs? And we chatted about it and there was a lot of interest, but there wasn't any clear understanding of what they could or should do, right? There wasn't a plan. There wasn't there was there was literally no document, nothing. It was just an idea that the executives had been discussing. So I wrote a small document for them and sent it around saying basically like do's and don'ts. And it was very much inspired by, you know, my and Josh and Alex's like journey building simple and, and having to jury rig so many disparate systems and, and things together just to get to the point where we could issue one checking account with one debit card to one individual, right? And and that actually sparked a lot of stuff within BBVA. They put a team to work on the problem and, and the team came out to Portland in, I think, early 15 and asked me to be an advisor. And, and one thing led to another. And by the end of 2015, I left Simple, moved to BBVA and was their global head of APIs or something. I don't remember. Yeah, I think that was my head. Uh, that was my title. And really, there wasn't, it wasn't like there were any APIs. Right? Uh, they had a lot of internal platforms with you know APIs talking to each other, but there was no thought into an external facing API platform. And there was a lot of interest and there was a lot of conversation happening, but not, not a lot of de- definition yet. So I basically put together this API strategy for them where I was like, Open banking, especially PSD2, was happening in Europe at that time. And that was driving a lot of work, but also a lot of interest where banks were being forced to open up and expose their consumer and and, and business data to other parties, especially fintech startups. But and, and the same thing was happening in the US, but it was happening differently because of, you know, the whole like data revolution was happening more through intermediaries, like initially Yodli and then Plaid. But in the US, I felt like there was a much larger opportunity to actually build infrastructure to not just allow those fintech startups to extract data from the banks, but actually be the underlying technology provided to them. And kind of the strategy that BBVA came up with, and I was, I was part of this, was basically the idea that like, hey, the fintech revolution is going to take over a large chunk of the banking industry. And they had some predictions that it might be as much as like 10% of the banking industry by the early 2020s, right? And And their idea was like, well, how do we deal with that as a traditional bank? And the first thing was like, well, you, you need to build a better bank, right? So you need to build better mobile apps, better online experiences, better branch experiences. And, and your traditional bank has to become a much better traditional bank. And that was, that was great. But it was like, is that going to be enough? Are you sure that you can just by pouring money into the traditional bank and investing smarter, you're going to be able to compete with all the fintech innovation that's happening? And the answer is maybe, maybe not, right? That might not be enough. So then it was like, well, in addition to that, we're going to invest in fintech startups. So Propel, I think, is the is, is BBVA's venture arm, and they set it up as an independent venture arm with them as the LP and, and tasked Propel with like investing a ton of money, mainly into fintech, but also, of course, crypto and other startups. So, hey, you try to beat them, but you also invest in them. You also buy them. So BBVA had an acquisition strategy, and you also partner with them. Right. And the API platform was the primary driver of the partnership piece, which was like, even if we can't beat them, we want to make sure that we are the technology provider that they are using. Because, you know, everybody in a in a tech startup is is 
very much focused on solving a specific problem for a specific set of customers. A lot of the infrastructure that's required to solve that problem, you can build it. But if somebody offers it to you as a service, you'd vastly prefer to do that, right? I mean, even in non fintech industries. I'm I'm sure if you had asked Elon Musk like whatever, 13, 14 years ago, he wouldn't have, if there was a massive network of electric superchargers across the US, he would have just plugged Teslas into those. It didn't exist. So he had to build that. And that was a huge part of the, the Tesla story, whether it's simple, whether it's Chime, everybody has a story of all the core technology that they had to build. And it's like, hey, if all of this was available through an easy, simple to use API, everybody would just move to using that. And that was the vision behind the API strategy at BBVA. Speaking about McKinsey and case studies and and business school, I think it's one of the most interesting case studies out there of a large bank moving fast and early ahead of a trend and really kind of going all in. And at the same time, still having organic difficulty in the traditional business, which can slow things down, can make operating decisions difficult, can make product prioritization difficult as well. I know we've taken a bit to get here, but I think it's just fantastic you've told us these parts of the story. Now, tell us about Scylla and how that came about, and in particular, what is it? I know there's been kind of evolution of the business. So what is it today, and kind of where did it start, and what is the journey on that like? Totally. So the I spent like two years at BBVA building out their API platforms and and eventually ended up launching two actually, one in Spain and one in the US. Built them, launched them, even got some early customers like Google to use uh, the open platform in the US. But it was very frustrating for me because I felt like, you know, I, w- I was spending most of my time just trying to solve the internal political issues within BBVA and trying to manage the different teams and everything. I never could really grow and scale the business the way I wanted to. So I left BBVA at the end of 2017, a little bit frustrated, thought about life for a while, and then decided that I still wanted to solve this problem. I just didn't want to solve it the way I was doing it at BBVA. I realized that what I really wanted to do was help people, whether they're early stage entrepreneurs or large late stage companies, help them innovate and program with money, right? And I was like, that's that's always been the core mission of Scylla. And by helping folks do that, right, I felt like we could unleash a whole a wave of financial innovation. We could help build so many new financial products and services. And I'm a firm believer that when it comes to innovation, more is better, right? And, and it's like, if you have more you know, fintech products and services being built and and delivered to customers. Obviously, not all of it will work. Some of it won't be, won't find that product market fit. But there is, I feel like there is huge, huge opportunity in this space. And we are still now barely at day one of this whole revolution. If you look at financial services globally, it's about a 20 trillion annual revenue industry. And that's out of a global GDP of around 100 trillion, right? If you look at global advertising, remember, advertising is where Facebook and Google and so many other companies make most of their revenue from. That's like a 600 billion to 800 billion a year revenue industry. So financial services is like 30 times larger than advertising, which makes sense when you think about it. Advertising is like the thin froth on, on top of the meat of the, you know, the global, uh, b- you're, global you're business, being right? uh, you're being mean to the internet. <laughs> well, so that's the thing, and that's a great point, Lex. Which is yeah, that, yeah. that the internet, if you look at what it's revolutionized up until like 2010, I would say it had revolutionized advertising and was beginning to revolutionize content delivery with like you know streaming and Netflix and 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 all of that, right? But so many large traditional industries which make up the, the bulk of global GDP, right? Obviously financial services, but also like healthcare, transportation, manufacturing, all of that basically untouched by the internet in, in 2010 and only beginning to be touched by the internet now, <laughs> 10, 12 years later. If you look at everybody from PayPal in the late 90s to Scylla today, added up all of our revenue, we are still less than 2% of you know, global financial services revenue across the globe. And that's much more, you know, companies like PayPal than Scylla, right? The 
industry is so large that the Netflix moment in financial services is going to take a generation. And, and we are still on day one of that. At this decade, though, I think from like 2020 to 2030, we're going to see the fintech and crypto share of financial services go from like 1% to 10%. And that's a huge growth for the entire industry. But guess what? Chase, Bofa, Wells, the big, the big traditional financial institutions are not going away. They're still going to be around well into the 2030s. And I think the, the, the more we can do to support that revolution, the better it is for people eventually, right? Like it's the consumers out there who get better access to financial services. They get better access to tools that help them live their lives and, and eventually go back to that core vision of, of Josh, which even in his original email, he talked about how a bank should stick to its core like business and then just help consumers find the best like if you know if you want a if you want a personal loan the bank should recommend what well, this is the best personal loan for you given all the data we have on you this is the best mortgage for you right so that that kind of that marketplace vision existed in that original josh email and i think that's that's right right the probably thousands of fintech apps out there and there's there's no reason why that can't be tens or even hundreds of thousands of fintech apps and and they can we can do a lot better in helping customers and that's kind of the the thing that we want to support at Scylla but not by directly serving those end users but by providing the infrastructure layer underneath we've been live for about three years now actually and we serve a variety of customers across I mean everything from like early stage fintech startups to a government agency, actually. <laughs> kind of the core area that we have focused on heavily, almost exclusively in the last two years is ACH payments and doing everything that you need to do around ACH payments, you know, initiating them, managing them, storing the money when it's, you know, coming from a payment or going to a payment and giving you all the tools you need to program with it. And then another thing that sep uh, separates us and has separated us from kind of the start is we've always been crypto friendly. We have infrastructure and Ethereum that some of our customers use. And we have several large crypto customers who use us as the backend plumbing to drive their, you know, mostly the ACH side of their business. So yeah, that continued to grow and scale. And, and I think given the size of this industry, <laughs> in another seven to 10 years, we will be an overnight success. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. Can you share any sort of scale of the business, like in terms of volume or customers, just so we have a sense of the types of folks that, that you're working with? Or maybe if there's anything you can say about the breadth of the product development, you know, because I think it's important to understand just how deeply you've built the company. Yes. So rather than sort of breadth of product, we've actually focused on depth of product, right? So but on the AC8 space specifically, we we do tens of thousands of ACH payments, move tens of millions a month right now, and, and that is growing rapidly. The, the area that we are really focused on is saying, hey, an ACH, by the way, is like a 50-year-old payment system, which is overnight, flat file based. It's kind of, it was state of the art in 1973, but any modern programmer just struggles to even understand how this, how this thing works, right? And we've kind of taken away a lot of that complexity and, and hidden it behind an API. But the other things that we do is actually the next level of that, which is like, okay, now you can initiate an ACH payment and you can onboard a user, you can verify their identity, you create a digital wallet or a virtual account, take the money, hold it, transfer it and pay it out. Great, that's awesome. Then you realize that like, well, people don't want just payments. They want fast payments, right? Like everybody in the world wants money right here, right now, instantaneously. That's not how the banking system works, right? Like this is a, a long weekend. And over a long weekend, the, the ACH doesn't run for like three days, <laughs> which is a long time to be waiting for your money. So the we built products. One of them is called Instant Settlement, where we say, hey, we will make the funds available immediately to our customers who are the app developers. But the risk of a failed payment, you know, an ACH return sits with the with the developers, right? And that's great in many use cases where you're doing things like B2B payments where people see like, you know, a return every other year. <laughs> so they're like, they're not worried about the risk of payments failing. They just want to, to speed it up and we have tools to make that happen. But in a lot of consumer use cases, risk and fraud is a huge, huge problem. And it's a much bigger problem now than it was even a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic. So we have a whole suite of tools built to help customers manage their risk and fraud themselves. One of them is this product called IACH, where you can 
onboard an end user, John Smith or Jane Doe, verify their identity, link their bank account, make one API call to pull in money from that bank account, and we will put that money in their wallet or virtual account instantaneously. So we're talking, you know, 10 seconds, not a day. (laughs) And we will guarantee it that if there's any return, we'll eat it, right? Now we run a whole suite of fraud technologies behind this, and we are constantly working on on improving that to kind of enable all of this. But that's a lot of the product focus now is around that, is on adding more payment systems and connecting to more financial networks, and then building more sophisticated fraud and, you know, payments management tools so that customers can scale those apps that they have built. And, you know, day one, everybody just wants to onboard their first user and get to their first transaction. Fast forward three years in and everybody is like, hey, I'm going from, you know, 50,000 to 500,000 users and fraud is becoming a problem and I need to build these six new things. What can you do to help me with that? And that's what we're doing now. Amazing stuff. Very compelling and complicated and also necessary for the industry to grow. Such an interesting conversation. We could go on and on, but we've got to wrap up. And I'd love for our audience to be able to learn more about both you and Sila. So where should they go? Website, social media presence, anything that you'd love to plug? So the website is silamoney.com. So go to www.sila m-o-n-e-y.com and you can learn everything about the business with the stuff that we do our docs are public our apis are public you can register in the sandbox and be programming within you know five minutes or developing and our pricing is, is public too so it's on the website as well we try to be as transparent and open kimono as possible and as for me personally i'm mostly accessible on twitter i think if you want to directly at me i'm shamir underscore k on twitter Shamir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Lex. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>